Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to session number eight. Uh, we have an outstanding paper award in the session, so stay tuned for that. And also, I'd like to request that if any of the speakers in the session uh, are not sitting in the front row, that they come up and uh, join us right up here, so it'll be easy to transition from talk to talk. And without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce the first uh, talk. So it's entitled, From Bandits to Experts, A Tale of Domination and Independence. And this is by Noga Alon, Ishai Mansour, Nicolo Cesabianchi, and Claudio Gentile. And Nicolo will be giving the talk. Thank you. Um, my voice uh, used to be better than this, but yesterday was even worse. Anyway, I hope to I'll make it to the, the end of the talk. Bear with me, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, this is about a model of learning which is called uh, non-stochastic sequential decision making. It's, uh, you can view it as an abstract model for online learning. And uh, uh, there's a player that repeatedly chooses action from a set of k available actions. And uh, so this, uh, the learning proceeds in uh, steps uh, at each step t. Uh, nature assigns a loss to every action in the set of k actions available. And this assignment is hidden from the player. And then the player picks some action xt, maybe the green one over there, and uh, possibly using randomization. And uh, it will, the player will incur the loss that nature had assigned to that specific action. Afterwards, the player will get some feedback information. Now, there are, two dif there are different models for getting feedback. The first of all is a bandit observation. The, the player only sees the loss of the action that he actually chose, whose loss is uh, paying. And in the expert model, or expert observation model, the player observes the loss also of the actions that haven't been selected. So all the losses are revealed to the player. In the next round, the next play, nature assigns a fresh uh, set of losses to actions, which again are hidden, and the player keeps on choosing and incurring losses. So if every uh, series of play is done either in the bandit model or in the expert model, so either two. And uh, in uh, either game, the bandit game or the expert game, the goal of the player is that his total loss must be close to that of the single best action. And here it's very important that we have no stochastic assumptions on the way, on the process, on nature that is assigning losses to actions. So this is very important. There is no probability. Is the only probability we'll, uh, we'll see here is the randomization of the player. Okay, how does the player, how is the player evaluated in this kind of games? Is evaluated according to regret, okay? The regret is a function of number of T plays. It's just the difference between the total loss of player. So this is the action he chose at MT, and this is the loss associated with that action we sum over, over time steps. And then we take the expectation over the possible randomization of the player. And we subtract to it the total loss of the single best, best action. So you see here, we have the minimum over action of the total loss of action A. And uh, since we assume that losses are uh, falling in a bounded interval, uh, this quantity and this quantity are both linear in T, so their difference is also at most linear in T. So the regret can grow at most linearly in T, even if the player plays at random. And uh, there are some known results for this model. So for the express model, the uh, hedge algorithm achieves a regret which is sublinear in t, uh, square root of t, and uh, uh, grows as the log of the number of av available actions. In the harder model for bandits, where you just observe the loss of the action that you played, there is another algorithm, x3, that, uh, whose regret is bounded by square root of time times k ln k. So you see there is an extra factor k, which accounts for the reduced feedback information that the player gets in the bandit model. This Algorithm. These models, learning models, these uh, sequential decision uh, models were pioneered in the 90s by Manfred Warmuth uh, sitting over here, Nick Littlestone, uh, Peter Auer, Rob Shapiro, and Joachim Freund, and myself. And uh, these bounds are known to be tight. 
only you can shave uh, shave only the log factor here in the bandit bound by using a more sophisticated version of X3. Now, here in this talk, we're going to look at a very nice model that interpolates between. What did I do? Okay, oops. That interpolates between uh, the experts and the bandit model. So suppose, for instance, that you want to apply this uh, abstract model to a rec recommendation system. Don't do it. But suppose that you want to do it. And uh, so suppose that you're selling uh, items uh, like cars to incoming customers. So now selecting an action means recommending uh, uh, the associated item to the, uh, to the customer. So for instance, um, if you select this item here, you will recommend some uh, this card to the customer. And if the customer likes it, it, it is likely that it will also be interested in this other car, which is very similar to this one. So you can now assume that every time you get some feedback for this action, you also will get some information about the feedback that you would have gotten if you had recommended this one. Okay, so you can establish a relationship uh, represented by this age. The relationship can be also directed. So for instance, if you recommended game consoles, electronics, let's say, and if you recommend a game console and the user is interested in game consoles, then he might be interested in uh, high resolution cables to connect it to the TV set. The other way around uh, is less likely. So you might have some directed uh, relationship between actions here. Okay. So, um, so now you can take your uh, actions uh, that we saw before and build a graph on them where the edges correspond to similarities between actions. So this is in the case of undirected similarities. All right? So now we can play the same game we played before, but with uh, the graph under, underneath. So now what happens? Suppose the player chooses this action, the green one, and now he will be given this, the neighborhood of the action he has chosen. Okay? So you see now that this model interpolates between uh, experts and bandits. In the experts, the graph is a click. No matter which action you choose, you are revealed the, the losses of all the other actions. In the bandits, it's just an edgeless graph. No matter what, which action you choose, you are only uh, uh, you only observe the loss that you are actually incurring. All right? So now we can sort of uh, uh, study these intermediate models. And uh, it turns out that the uh, undirected case, uh, the crucial quantity is the independence number of the graph, which is the size of the lar largest independence set. So this is the largest set of vertices su such that uh, no two of them are connected by an edge. All right? And uh, Manor and Shamir showed uh, using the ELP algorithm that uh, basically you can obtain a regret bound of this form where this is the independence number of the graph. And uh, you see that uh, this bound interpolates between the experts bound where you have a click and the independent number of the click is one and the bandit case where you have an, an edgeless graph and the independent uh, uh, number, independence number of that is K. So you recover both bounds. However, the algorithm is kind of complicated. It must solve a linear program at each step. Another interesting feature of this algorithm is that uh, the result holds also when the graph changes over time. So the uh, set of the associations between the similarities between actions can evolve over time, in which case you have the, just the sum in the regret bound. You just have the sum of the independence numbers for the single graphs. OK. So our results build on that. And uh, OK. And we, first of all, for the undirected case, uh, we obtain an algorithm which is as the same regret bound as the uh, Manor and uh, Shamir algorithm, but it doesn't need to solve any linear program. And uh, kind of surprisingly, it doesn't even need to know the uh, current graph, the current similarity graph of among, uh, between actions before making a predictions, uh, any prediction. So it, it doesn't. It, it only needs to know the graph among actions after a prediction has been made in order to update the, uh, uh, to refine the probability, for, uh, the pro the probability distribution of actions. So we'll come back to this afterwards. The second set of results is for directed uh, observation graphs. And we have a second algorithm. And uh, <coughs> directed observation graphs are harder because uh, than the undirected case because in this case, the player receives less information than the indirected case, because uh, uh, orientation of edges reduces the feedback information. We see that in a moment. Yet, yet uh, we can prove that uh, the regret gets only worse by uh, logarithmic uh, factors. 
So we have reduced the information, but we don't pay too much in the regret for that. However, in this case, the uh, observation, observational graph uh, must be known before each prediction because it is needed in order to compute the probability distribution with which, with which the player chooses the action. Okay. So let's see for the undirected observation graphs, the player strategy is very similar to the X3 algorithm. <coughs> so uh, the player puts an overwhelming probability of uh, picking an, the action whose uh, uh, cumulative estimated loss in the past is minimal. Okay, so there's a minus, minus here. And the estimated uh, loss is computed according to impo important, uh, importance sampling, uh, just like in the X3 algorithm. And uh, just uh, here, in order to compute this probability, which is the probability that the loss is observed, uh, you need to know the, the structure of the graph. So before, in order to choose in the action, you don't, know to, uh, you don't need to know the structure of the current graph, but in order to update your estimates, you need to observe it. OK. And uh, in the analysis, OK, the analysis is kind of similar to the standard bandit analysis. And uh, you end up with a form in which you have this uh, sum of conditional probabilities, which is the key uh, element. And uh, a very nice result, which was already proven by Shamir and Manor, and we reprove uh, uh, on a purely combinatorial basis, is that you can upper bound this quantity by the independence number of the graph. And now it's very easy to see that by choosing eta properly, you can obtain the de desired regret bound. OK, uh, so you can check special cases that is, is this quantity in the bandit case amounts to 1, so that when you sum it up, uh, you get k, which is exactly the independence number for the edgeless graph. And in the case of experts, you get just the probability of picking the action so that when you sum it up over the action, you get uh, uh, 1, which is the independence number of the clique. So this is all nice. And uh, you have a complete characterization because this upper bound is tight. You can prove a, a, a matching lower bound up to logarithmic factors. So in the directed observation graph, things become uh, uh, more difficult. So here you see whenever, you pick an, whenever a player picks an action, he gets the loss of that action and then uh, observes the losses of all the actions that are reachable in the neighborhood by the action he chose. So for instance, this one is not observed because it is in, a, in the neighborhood of the undirected graph but not reachable by the chosen action, see, this one. Okay, so the feedback is less with respect to the same graph without orientation. So, and this shows up in the analysis, indeed, uh, you see that you cannot control this quantity, which was key in the analysis of the undirected case, uh, by the uh, independence number of the graph. Okay, and there is an example. So there is a click, and you can uh, make uh, by orienting the edges, you make you can make a total order on uh, this sequence of actions. In this case, since it's a click, the independence number, if you ignore edge orientation, is one. But there exist uh, distributions uh, over actions such that the the crucial quantity that we want to control is linear in the number of actions, even though the independence number is constant. So now you need something here in order to, uh, to do this, uh, in order to control this quantity. And uh, the key trick we use uh, is uh, a dominating set. So we go from uh, independence to domination rather than from domination to independence. I'm, I'm sorry, so it's kind of a... <laughs> um, so what is a dominating, a dominating set of uh, an oriented graph? That's uh, the smallest set of uh, vertices such that any other vertice, vertex not in that set uh, is reached by at least an edge of a vertex in the dominating set. Okay, so this is the smallest dominating set for this graph. Now, the, if you introduce exploration in your algorithm uh, over uh, the a dominating set of the graph, this exploration is, uh, will help to increase the probability of observing the losses of actions. Because essentially, you, um, you give a fair chance of observing the loss of any action irrespective to the structure of the graph. And this is the, essentially the trick that is, uh, that is uh, uh, done by performing exploration over a dominating set. So essentially, you, read, uh, you increase uh, the conditioning event over here, and so this conditional probability goes down, and you can control it better. And the dominating set, you don't need to compute it exactly. You can just take a greedy approximation, and you are, then you are off by a log factor, which is essentially OK in the regret bound. So now there is a very nice lemma. You remember in the undirected case, this quantity here was controlled by the independence uh, uh, number of the graph. 
in the directed case, if we constrain the probability by introducing this exploration over the dominating set, we are able to control this quantity essentially in the same way, uh, though we introduce this additional log uh, kt factor here. All right? And the proof here uses the Turan's theorem, which relates the independence number of a graph to its density. And you can see uh, no galon uh, spirit in this proof here. OK. Again, if we plug this in the previous analysis, and uh, there is a bit more work to do, and this gives us a regret, which is uh, very similar to what we had before. It's just worse by logarithmic factors. Good. So conclusions. So we saw that, uh, OK, there are two issues here that are interesting. First of all, the lack of feedback used, uh, caused by edge orientation costs you only log factors in the regret because of this trick of using a dominating set for performing exploration. And uh, there is another issue here. In the undirected case, you can uh, get away making prediction without knowing the, the structure of the graph in advance. You just, even, the graph, even when the graph evolves over time, you can make a prediction without knowing the graph. You just give, you're given the graph after the prediction in order to update your probabilities. And uh, if you try to, to do this in the directed case, e, then uh, you get a much worse regret. So it's not clear whether this uh, obser obs the observing the graph is necessary in the directed case in order to get a tight regret bound, uh, at least within logarithmic factors. OK, so this is in a, an interesting open problem. Thank you. I'm done. Uh. OK, uh, we have time for a few questions. All right. Thanks. OK. So um, if you have a graph that has a um, very large independence number, but there is a single action that's very well connected, and suppose that one is the best, does your algorithm kind of benefit from that? You, you mean in the directed case? Uh, in either of the two. So in principle... No, yes. Uh, I mean, it, OK, then the independence... Oh, so the, the independence it's, number it's is kind of a, if, if you have a very well-connected action, the independence number cannot be too okay, uh, so high. It's most interesting in the directed case, then? In the directed case, then uh, that action will be in the dominating set, most likely. Yes. Thank you. Uh, it's just a quick clarification question. Do you assume that when in, if there's an edge, when you, re you receive full feedback for all the neighbors? You, or, or you, do you, you receive correlate, some, some, some notion of correlated feedback? OK, in, the, you can, in, this, in this setup, you see the losses that were assigned to the neighbors. Exactly. You can assume that you just see a, a stochastic signal, which is uh, uh, drawn from a distribution for, from, let's say, do you have results for that case? Um, no, but I don't think it's, it's, it's a problem. We have results from random graphs, but not for random uh, uh, observations. But I don't think it's a, it's a big deal to get that. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, so let's uh, thank the speaker once more. Can you? Yeah, I don't have any more hands. OK, so uh, moving right along, um, the second talk of the session is entitled uh, Eluder Dimension and the Sample Complexity of Optimistic Exploration. And this is by Dan Russo and Benjamin Van Roy. And Dan will give the talk. OK, thank you. So I'm going to start with a motivating example, which is the online shortest path problem with bandit feedback. That's not good. Thank you. OK. So this kind of problem arises, for example, in wireless network routing. So we want to repeatedly route packets through this network from a starting node, V1, to an ending node, V12. And the time for a packet to travel between two neighboring nodes is inherently random. But there are fixed underlying parameters to the network that specify the expected travel time between two neighboring nodes. These parameters are unknown to us, however reflecting, for example, the fact that we may be uncertain about the amount of traffic currently headed through different parts of the network. But when we route a packet through the network, we observe that total travel time 
of the path that was taken. And from these observations, we can learn. Our goal is to route a large number of packets through this network in a way that minimizes the expected, uh, sorry, the expected cumulative travel time. And here we see a tension between exploration and exploitation. So by trying new paths in this network, we may be able to learn how to route future packets more efficiently. But this experimentation is costly, and we want to manage it carefully. This is an example of a linear bandit problem. Notice that the travel time along some given path is the sum of the travel times along each of the edges in that path. We could formulate a more general linear bandit problem as follows. So there'll be some action set, here's script A, and we'll associate with each action a feature vector phi of A. We'll model the mean reward of an action as the inner product between this known feature vector and some unknown parameter theta. And the goal is to learn to take near optimal actions where the largest expected reward is given by the maximization problem in the final bullet. An interesting feature of the linear bandit model is that because of the known structure to the rewards at different actions, we're able to learn from our samples of certain actions about the reward value at other actions. And this can allow us to learn to attain near optimal performance while never sampling some of the possible actions. Uh, this insight is formalized in several recent papers that show that variants of a UCB algorithm yield tight regret bounds of order d square root t. Here d is the dimension of the linear model, and t is the time horizon of the problem. I'll define regret more precisely in a moment, but for now the key takeaway is that this bound exhibits no dependence on the number of actions, and instead depends only on the dimension of the linear model somehow the complexity of our model class. What we're interested in here is understanding what happens when we consider more general types of model classes, and in understanding how our performance depends on the complexity of these model classes, and how we measure that complexity. So I'll formulate a more general multi-armed bandit problem as follows. We want to take actions with near optimal expected reward the expected reward of an action is specified by a fixed reward function. Here we denote that by f sub theta. And we don't know this reward function, but we know that it lies in some class of possible functions. Here, script f, which is parameterized by theta. We may also have some prior distribution over the set of reward functions. And the agent's going to sequentially choose actions, a1, a2, and so on. And upon choosing an action, will observe a random reward that's drawn with fixed mean as specified by the reward function. Now, from these observations, the agent can learn over time to make increasingly effective decisions. So this process is depicted in the diagram at the bottom of the slide. We specify some model of the system, for example, the class of reward functions, and then we choose an action, we observe some reward, we learn from the observed reward, and we choose another action. And the cycle continues. We'll evaluate the performance of an algorithm in terms of its regret, where we say that the regret up to time t measures the cumulative gap in performance between an algorithm that knows the optimal action and always chooses that, and the actual algorithm we've selected and the actions a1 up to a capital T that are indeed chosen. The main contribution of this work is an upper bound on expected regret of the form shown here in blue. And this depends on the complexity of the class of functions through two measures. The first is the log covering number of the function class. This measure is closely related to many notions from statistical learning theory, say from the study of supervised learning, and it's roughly capturing the sensitivity of the class of reward functions to statistical overfitting. But we also need a new measure of complexity that we call the eluder dimension. And this is roughly capturing how sampling one action allows us to reduce our uncertainty about the reward value at other actions. And we do this for two types of algorithms. 
One is Thompson sampling, and one is UC, a general UCB algorithm. These are very popular types of algorithms that are actually widely used in practice. Um, and now if you take this bound and you specialize it to the case of linear reward functions or generalized linear reward functions, you recover the tightest known regret bounds for UCB algorithms that are specifically designed to address those problem classes. And those bounds are themselves nearly tight. So it's natural to wonder whether familiar notions from the study of supervised learning might suffice when considering these general multi-armed bandit problems. What I'm going to show you here through an example is that a significantly new notion is needed. So consider the following problem. Let's fix an, ac sorry, let's fix an action set containing actions A1 up through AN and a set of possible reward functions F1 up through FN. Now the ith function is going to take on the value 0 at all actions except the action AI, at which it takes on the value 1. So it looks like this picture depicted here on the right, where it takes on the value 0 for all of these actions, except there's a single one at which the reward value spikes up to 1. Now we want to consider a noiseless prediction problem in this setting. So suppose that we draw actions uniformly at random from the action set. And all we want to do is label the reward value at the uh, selected action. Well, here we note that the reward function takes on the value 0 at all except for a single action. And so already, just predicting the value 0 yields a low error rate of 1 over n. Theoretical results would also suggest that this is an easy statistical prediction problem. For example, the VC dimension of this class of functions is independent of n. It's just 1. And other notions of complexity would give a similar result. But if we consider the closely related multi-armed bandit problem, then we get a different story. Here, in order to attain near-optimal performance, we actually have to identify which action is optimal. So in this picture here, we need to identify where along the horizontal axis the spike in the function value occurs. And this turns out to be very hard. Notice that whenever a suboptimal action is selected, we observe the reward value of 0. But all except one function in this function class agree on that prediction. And so we rule out only a single prediction, sorry, only a single function based on this observation. In the worst case, we can only identify which action is optimal by exhaustively sampling every possible action. And therefore, regret is going to scale linearly with n in the bandit setting. So here, we seem to need a new notion of complexity that can capture problems of this form. And we're going to introduce that now. Before giving a precise definition, I want to give a motivating story. Um, let's consider a politician who's speaking to a group of reporters, but who would like to keep his true position hidden from them. So the politician is going to sequentially present pieces of information, but each piece of information has to be new, in the sense that it can't be some clear consequence of what he's already told them. So the question is, how long can he continue to elude the reporters? So how long can he continue before his true position is pinned down? So this is a measure of the information structure of the problem. And it captures the essence of what we'll define to be the eluder dimension. So to give a more precise definition, I'm going to start with a notion of independence. Roughly, for, two, for a given class of reward functions, we'll say that an action A is independent of other actions A1 up to AN if we can find two functions in that reward class that make similar predictions at the f these actions A1 through AN, but could nevertheless differ significantly at action A. So in this picture at the bottom of the slide, the action A10 seems to be approximately independent of the first nine actions because these two functions, depicted by blue and red dots, are close together in their predictions in the first nine actions and then are very different in their predictions at the tenth. More precisely, I'll say that an action A is epsilon independent of other actions A1 through AN with respect to the class of reward functions if we can find two functions in that function class that make similar predictions 
on A1 through AN overall, as measured by bullet point one, and then differ significantly in their predictions at A, as measured by bullet point two. We then take the eluder dimension of, the, of this problem to be the length of the longest sequence of actions, such that each action in that sequence is appropriately independent of its predecessors. And this then leads to a new notion of model complexity that we use to bound the expected regret of two types of algorithms. I haven't really commented on these algorithms yet, but I'll do that just briefly now. So one type of algorithm is a general UCB algorithm, or an optimistic algorithm. And the rough idea is as follows. In the first step, we construct a confidence set. So a subset of the set of reward functions containing all of those that are statistically plausible given the data that's been observed. Then we build an optimistic model of the environment under which the value of each action is taken to be the best value that's consistent with one of the plausible models. In the final step, and this is bullet point two, we take an action that's optimal under the optimistic model of the environment. And here, optimism encourages exploration because optimistic values tend to be higher at poorly understood actions. But as we sample poorly understood actions, we learn about them, and these optimistic estimates are adjusted. This process causes the algorithm to, over time, converge toward optimality. What we do is construct a specific optimistic algorithm and then study its rate of convergence. I should note that there's a very large literature on this approach spanning multiple problem classes. The second type of algorithm we study is a posterior sampling strategy. It's known as Thompson sampling or as probability matching. And the rough idea is to start with a prior distribution over the family of reward functions and then at each time step to sample an action according to the posterior probability that it is indeed the optimal action. Now, an earlier paper of ours, titled Learning to Optimize via Posterior Sampling, establishes a close connection between Thompson sampling and optimistic algorithms. And it's going to allow us to analyze these algorithms in tandem in this paper. Um, in particular, what we get for Thompson sampling is a bound on its Bayesian regret, or its expected regret under the prior distribution. I'll just briefly sketch the proof of our main result, there are two main technical steps that are needed to complete the analysis. In the first step, we build general confidence sets, so subsets of the set of reward functions containing all of those that are statistically plausible given the observed data. And the size of these confidence sets depends on the log covering number of the function class. So that leads to the first notion of model complexity. In the second step, we measure the rate at which confidence intervals shrink at different actions as we explore. And that depends on the eluder dimension of the function class and leads to the second notion of model complexity. Just conclude by wrapping up. What we've discussed is how multi-armed bandit problems seem to require fundamentally different notions of model complexity than what we're familiar with from, say, supervised learning. But I think that there's a huge value in having a unified and precise conceptual understanding of these problems, and that a lot more work is needed in order to reach this goal. Uh, here, we've taken one step forward, and I hope it inspires a lot of further investigation. Okay, thank you. That's it. Any questions for the speaker? Yeah, just a quick question. How do you estimate the eluder dimension? How do you estimate it? Um, I guess I'm not sure from data. So here we have a known class of functions. So we bound it analytically in special cases. Um, um, out of curiosity, do you have a lower bound in terms of the eluder dimension? Because so there seems to be a natural uh, strategy that the environment can play, which is to play the function that is the, the one that is eluding the actions that you're taking. So, uh, yeah, so we don't have a lower bound. 
Mm -hmm. And I don't think that in general an optimistic algorithm will be optimal for the full family of, of problems here. So there is a lower bound in the sense that there are cases, like the class of linear models, under which the bound is tight. But it's not tight for all possible function classes. So I you, don't think. So does that mean you have a lower bound, just one that is not tight? No, we don't have a general lower okay. bound. No, no. So for certain function classes, you can get a regret which is not in square root t. Um, yes. Can you get this with your analysis? So not with our current analysis. You can with eluder dimension, I believe. But our analysis and our confidence sets aren't tight enough, say, for every example that's been considered in the multi-arm bandit framework. There's one. Yeah, sure. And, and do you think this is useful for problem-dependent lower bound, uh, problem-dependent bounds as well? I do believe that for, or at least eluder dimension, I believe yeah. can be. Okay. Yes. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker once more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. The next talk is entitled Adaptive Market Making uh, via Online Learning, and this is by Jacob Abernethy and Satyan Kale, and Satyan will give the talk. Okay, thanks so for the introduction. Um, yeah, this is on uh, market making using online learning, and this joint work with uh, Jake Abernethy, who is at the University of Michigan. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to start by describing the setting for market making in, uh, in stock markets. So, um, so when you go to a stock market and you want to transact, you want to buy or sell a share, with whom do you really transact, okay? So basically there is a, something known as an order book for every financial commodity, which uh, essentially lists for every share how many um, shares of, a, you know, are people willing to sell for a certain price and how many uh, shares of, uh, are people willing to buy for a certain price, okay? So for example, here's an order book for the Bitcoin market, uh, Bitcoin USD market from yesterday. So you can see that at uh, various price levels there are various amounts of Bitcoins that are being sold at that price. Um, and traders can interact with such an order book by placing market or limit orders, okay? Uh, so, so where do market makers come in? So market makers provide liquidity to any financial market. They provide, they do so by providing um, buy and sell, both, both buy and sell orders to the order book. So they take positions on both sides of the order book. And uh, the reason that, I mean, it might seem like a pointless exercise, but the reason they do it is because they always quote a sell price that's higher than the buy price. Okay? And their hope is by transacting with people who want to actually buy and sell um, that financial commodity, they can actually make a, make a profit by looking at the spread, which is the difference between the buy and sell price. Okay? So, um, so in this particular scenario, in the Bitcoin market, for example, the spread was like about $9 on a price of about $900. So it was about 1%. Okay? So that's so by making many many such transactions and looking at the spread that they have between the buy and sell price, market makers make their profit. Okay. All right. Um, so in in this talk, we, we consider the question of how do we how do market makers uh, actually work? Okay. So how do they set their spread sizes and how do they make money? Um, and we consider the question of how you know how do we set uh, you know uh, what is the principled way of setting different spread sizes adaptively? And we, we use the techniques of uh, expert learning or online learning to handle to tackle this question. And uh, it, uh, there are s several difficulties in actually applying standard techniques from online learning for this problem, namely the fact that these problems come with a lot of state information, and typical online learning algorithms can't actually handle state. Uh, but we actually give some theoretical results which show how to be how to handle a state that is implicit in a, um, in a spread-based strategy. And we actually implemented our algorithms on real data that Jake downloaded from some website. Uh, and it somehow ended up performing better than expected, sometimes even beating the best strategy in, in hindsight. Okay. So that's the, that's the plan for the talk. Um, so to set, set the setting a little bit more formally, so we considered an online uh, market making uh, scenario where uh, transactions are always, uh, always done at various discrete time steps. So time steps are indicated uh, by little t, which goes from one to capital T. Uh, before the beginning of every time step, a market maker places uh, their buy and sell orders to the book. Then, uh, then they observe the, 
the current price of the commodity, uh, which might be adversarially set. So we don't make any stochastic assumptions on the, on the price of the commodity. Um, and then once the price is observed, the market maker observe, uh, executes any applicable orders. Okay? So if the price is very low, it, uh, then they might actually end up buying some shares. If the price is high, they might end up selling some shares. Okay? But that's how the market maker in interacts with the, with the, with the market. Um, so so let's, let's go, come back to the notion of spread. So, so market makers want to uh, make a profit by uh, quoting buy and sell prices, which are, uh, which are away from each other. And um, a simple uh, way of doing it is, is uh, something known as a spread by strategy. And uh, this is a natural class of strategies. It, it is parameterized by a spread size parameter B. And what a market maker does with this spread size parameter is to specify a window okay, of price levels uh, starting from uh, price level AT all the way to AT plus B. Okay? So that's the window right there. Um, and then once the window is specified, the market maker places an order to buy one share of the financial commodity for every price level that's below AT. And then he places an order to, play, uh, to buy, sorry, to sell one share of the financial commodity for every price level that's higher than the, uh, the right end point of the window. Okay? So the gap, uh, the gap between the left and right end points is the spread. Now, uh, let's see what, what happens when, when you actually get, the, get to see the price of the commodity. If the price falls inside your window, then uh, none of these buy and sell orders are applicable. The price is too high to buy any stocks. The price is too low to sell any, uh, any stocks. So nothing happens. There's no transactions. The window does not move. The, uh, the market maker stays where he is. Um, on the other hand, if the price actually is lower than the, than the left end point, then uh, all of these uh, AT minus PT buy orders come into effect because the price is low enough. So at this point, the market maker can go ahead and purchase uh, these AT minus uh, PT uh, shares, okay? And then he moves the window so that the, uh, the new window exactly captures the, the current price, okay? So graphically what happens is, uh, essentially you move all the shares that you just bought to the sell side of the book, and then you move the window so that basically uh, your new window exactly captures the, the, the current price, okay? So you see what is happening here. Basically, whatever stocks were bought by the market maker, they're immediately offered for sa sale at a price that's about B units higher than, than what they're bought for, okay? So if, if at some point the price ends up becoming higher than the right end point, then all of these shares will be sold and the market maker can book a profit of B for every such, um, every such uh, share. That's basically how they make money. Uh, something similar happens if the price uh, is, is larger than you know, the right end point, in which case the market maker will sell a bunch of shares and move the window to the right so that it again uh, captures the current price. Okay? All right, so uh, hopefully I've, I've, uh, from these pictures I've convinced you that uh, the, the reason you might want to have a large spread size is because the buy and sell orders for, um, for the shares are, are, are matched, essentially. So for every such matched pair, you end up booking a profit of B. Okay? That's the upside, and that's how market makers make their profit. But the downside is that what happens if the, if the price never actually leaves your window? If the, the fluctuations in your prices are very small and the, and the price stays inside the window, then there'll be no transaction, so there, there's no profit to be made anyway. So if you end up, if you have a large window, then you run the risk of having no transactions because the price stays inside the window. On the other hand, you, if you take a small window, then you might actually make a lot of small amounts of profits so that might be good as well. So, so there's both upsides and downsides of choosing large and small windows. Um, so, so one way of characterizing the, the, um, the effect of having a, 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 a specific spread size is, um, is given by this theorem here, which we prove in our paper. Um, so the, the theorem shows that, I mean, it's not important to understand the, uh, the expression, but it shows that basically you make a profit of about B over 2 every time the window shifts. Okay? If the window does not shift, you don't make any profit. On the other hand, you might also end up making a large loss if the final window is very different from the initial one. Okay? So if you somehow don't balance your books, then you might end up making a large loss. So, so that's um, one of the statements from our paper. Okay, now given these upsides and downsides of, um, of different spread sizes, you might ask, okay, how do we select a good spread size, okay? So since we take the view that prices are generated online without uh, any specific stochastic assumptions, we have no knowledge of how the prices are going to evolve in the future, 
So we don't really know exactly how, how to choose a specific spread size. Okay? So we might take the online learning approach to tackle this problem uh, by, by considering a, a class of different spread sizes. Okay? So, so there's uh, some, set of, some set B of candidate spread sizes that you might want to use for your price sequence. You just don't know which one is the best one. Okay? Uh, and uh, a goal of an adaptive spread um, uh, spread uh, based market making strategy is to is to basically come up with a way of ch changing spreads online as you go along so that your payoff is about as high as the best um, best payoff that you could get from your candidate set of spreads that's the standard notion of uh, uh, that we use in online learning and the performance metric is something known as the regret which has been talked about in the last couple of talks the regret is simply the payoff of the of the best possible um, spread-based strategy among your set minus the, the regret of, uh, the, sorry, the payoff of the algorithm. Okay, so now, um, since we have such a well-developed theory of online learning, you might be tempted to apply a simple experts learning algorithm or something like that. But the problem is that online learning algorithms typically assume that we have no state in the, uh, especially expert learning algorithms. Um, and here, our strategies have very um, significant state. And that state is represented by the amount of stock they are currently holding. Okay? So different strategies might hold different amounts of stock. And it might not be easy to, to just compare the amount of holdings that one strategy has versus another strategy. Okay? Um, and this might motivate you to try a different model, maybe like reinforcement learning or something. Maybe online learning is not appropriate. But it turns out that somehow we can actually handle this, this problem of state using some combinatorial statements that we prove. And we can actually give an algorithm which has um, square root t regret after, after t steps. So that's our main theorem. It's an adaptive algorithm which gets square root t regret after t steps. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll go into some details of how we actually design this algorithm. So the, question, so the main question is how do we handle the state of the problem? Okay, so the state, by, by state I simply mean the amount of stock that a current strategy is holding. That, I mean, and that, that amount could be both positive or negative based on whether they have been buying or selling stocks. Um, so the first statement that we actually prove uh, is something which we call a nesting lemma. It's a very simple statement which says that if you have two different spread sizes, B and B prime, let's say B smaller than B prime, and if initially the window for, for B is nested inside the window for B prime, then this always happens. I mean, this, this stays so, okay? The windows never cross each other somehow, okay? And um, the proof is actually quite simple. I, I won't go into the details. It's, I'm going to give a proof of a picture. So there's a simple case analysis. You, you, you look at where um, the, 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 the price falls. And uh, by looking at where the price falls, you notice that the windows shift in such a way that they always stay nested. Okay? That's nice. Um, the second sta uh, statement that we prove is something uh, we call the invariance lemma. Uh, again, it's a simple statement which says that the amount of stock holdings held by any strategy is exactly characterized by the left end point of your window. In fact, if you add up the amount of stock holdings, which may be negative or positive, with, uh, the, with the left end point, then that is a constant over all time. Okay? Again, this is a, a statement that you can prove by picture here. Um, you simply take the three different cases. You look at how much uh, the window moves with different uh, uh, different possibilities for where the, uh, where the stock uh, price falls, and you realize that the amount of um, change in your holdings is exactly offset by the amount of change in the left end point. Okay? So, so this, is, this is again a, a, another convenient combinatorial statement that we can prove. The upshot of these two uh, lemmas is that the state is actually not such a big deal. So the difference, so any two spread-based strategies uh, in, our, in our given class will actually have very similar state. So the, the total amount of stock that they hold will be, uh, will be basically the same up to a constant amount. Okay? Uh, now this is very convenient because that, that means that we can actually change state from one strategy to a different strategy with the bounded cost. Okay? It's in fact a constant cost. And now we can directly plug this um, observation into a regret minimizing algorithm, uh, which is based on a standard experts learning um, algorithm such as multiplicative updates or or uh, follow the perturbed leader. What the algorithm does is um, it runs this export learning algorithm on a set of strategies. Whenever uh, the algorithm prescribes a strategy that has not been used in the previous round, then you simply execute some market orders to ensure that the state is, is the same as the new strategy. 
And you can do that again with, with a constant cost because the, um, the difference between the, state, the states is bounded. And once your state is matched, you execute the same buy or sell orders that the new strategy prescribes. Okay. And, and you continue in this manner. OK, so that's the, that's the algorithm. Um, it's fairly simple to show that the regret of this meta-algorithm can be expressed as the, as the regret of the base expert learning algorithm, uh, like multiplicative weights of the product leader, plus the number of times your state uh, changes, essentially the number of times you change an expert in your expert learning algorithm. Okay. Um, and for, for either multiplicative updates or follow the product leader, you can bound the total number of expert changes by, by square root t. And also the regret is also bounded by square root t. And adding the two together, we get a bound of square root t in the, in the regret of the algorithm. OK, so that's a, or a, that's a generic algorithm. Um, so, so with this algorithm, we ran some simple, um, simple experiments by using data that, were, uh, that Jake downloaded from some websites. Um, we implemented the algorithm with multiple updates. We also did it with follow the product leader. And we tested it with some simple baselines like uniform averaging or follow the leader, in fact. Um, and also, we compared with the, with the best strategy in hindsight. We obtained some somewhat of surprising results. Um, so, so while the algorithm that was based on multiplicative updates was almost as good as the best strategy in hindsight, which is not surprising, what was interesting was that sometimes we actually obtained a payoff that was better than the best strategy in hindsight. Which is a uh, which is somewhat surprising, and it some, seems to indicate that what we had been considering as as cost in terms of you know switching from one strategy to another actually turned out to be a payoff. Sometimes actually beneficial to change state, and uh, we don't really have a sorry good understanding of how that happens. But um, but yeah, but the algorithm seems to have pretty good performance in on on real data. Um, yeah, so the, I think that's uh, all I have to say <laughs> about this work, and thank you very much. And please stop by our poster. Okay. Hi. Uh, it Hi. seems uh, you don't take into account transaction costs. No, uh, we don't, yeah. So how does that complicate? I would think a lot of your proofs won't, might not hold. Um, that's I mean, if you, if you think of transaction cost as being a multiplicative factor, I think that can be handled. But I mean, I haven't thought about it very well. But, I mean, this is, this is all, these are all additive guarantees. So, um, OK, so I, uh, okay, I can actually answer you the, uh, right now, just thinking about it. We'll get the same kind of regret bounds, because basically, we obtain the same performance as the best strategy, and it, which would include the transaction costs, and the extra um, state switching cost is only bounded by square root t. And that's the, so that the extra transaction cost that we might increase also square root t. So we'll get the same kind of regret bounds. Okay, questions? Yeah. I can hear you. <laughs> as long as you may need to. But in, in real life, T is, has a finite time. You know, T is less yeah. than 400 minutes. Yeah, so, so you know, I mean, we, we actually never use the fact or even assume that T is unbounded. Even in our experiments, we basically only did this um, process for like a day's worth of data. And actually, maybe I should have mentioned in the beginning is that um, so we assume that t is actually a finite number, and at the end of um, all the trading periods t, you have to liquidate your inventory. So that's that's the assumption in this. Uh, um, so you you know whatever position you have, you just have to liquidate it at the current market price. Okay, great. Okay. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Any So what ensures that you have square root t switches only? I'm sorry? So what ensures that you have square root t switches only? Because in general, you could have more. Um, OK, I mean, so in general, you could have more. But OK, so maybe what I, what I explained here was not completely accurate. We actually mix strategies using the weights that are given by the experts algorithm. And then the, all we need to bound is the 
L1 difference between the, between the weights from one round to another. And that is actually bounded by square root T. So even though you, know, you might not get actually square root T switches, but we can actually mix them. Um, actually, we, by mixing them in the same time, you mix the holdings, you mix the orders as well. So that's what we do technically. Thank the speaker again, please. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, thank you. All right. So the next uh, uh, paper is the recipient of the outstanding paper award. Uh, the title of the of the talk is Submodular Optimization with Submodular Cover and Submodular Knapsack Constraints. And this is by Rishab Iyer and Jeff Bilms from the University of Washington. And I'd like to invite both of the authors, please, on the stage so to receive their uh, certificates. Please join me in congratulating them. And Rishab will now give us the outstanding talk. Okay. Yeah, thank you for coming for the talk and thanks for the award. Um, <clears throat> okay. It was short. <laughs> Is this? But it doesn't seem to be anything coming in here. It's gone again. Okay. Now fix this. Why won't you test everything before I need it? Yeah. <laughs> you need it, right? Okay. Yeah. Does anyone know where the lights are on? I'll just leave this one. Yeah, it again seems to have gone. Okay. <laughs> now it's going to work. Yeah. Okay, I'll just use this probably. It's fine. <clears throat> okay, sorry. Um, so today I'll be talking on uh, submodular optimization with submodular cover and submodular knapsack constraints. Uh, and this is joint work with Jeff Bilms. So the outline of the talk is I will uh, give a brief introduction of submodular functions. Um, then give the problem formulation uh, and actually motivate our formulation as well. And then um, give a kind of unifying framework of algorithms and hardness results. Uh, and finally end with some empirical results. So starting from the very basics, um, set functions are functions defined on a finite ground set of items. And essentially for every, for every finite ground set, you have a subset, and a set function provides a valuation for every subset. Submodular functions are a special class of set functions that have what is known as a diminishing returns property. And essentially, um, the diminishing returns property basically says that the gain of adding elements shrinks as the context of the set grows. 
So a, a, a kind of canonical example of this is the urns and balls example. Uh, if we define a set function as the number of distinct colors of the balls in an urn, then it's easy to see that this function is submodular since you have a diminishing returns. A set function or a submodular function is said to be monotone if, uh, uh, if the valuation of the function grows as the context of the set grows. And finally, uh, I would like to introduce the notion of a modular function, which in some sense is the kind of continuous or the discrete equivalent to the linear function in the continuous domain. So submodular functions have, uh, in some sense, have two sides. Uh, one of them is the aspect of submodular minimization, um, where in some sense we want to minimize a submodular function over all possible subsets. Uh, this problem is polynomial time and in some sense reflects uh, the relation to convexity. From an application's perspective, this kind of models cooperation between items and this is because of the diminishing returns property that in some sense you have, you have many items, they cooperate to reduce the cost if you, rather than if you had the sum of the individual items. The other side is of submodular maximization where we maximize a submodular function over all possible subsets. Um, while this problem is NP hard, it turns out that you can get a number of constant factor approximation guarantees. Uh, and, and in some sense, this kind of relates, uh, is, is a relation to concavity of submodular functions. Um, from an application's perspective, uh, this is very useful in modeling diversity and coverage in a lot of uh, subset selection problems. Often, however, what we want, in some sense, is to simultaneously maximize coverage or diversity while kind of minimizing cooperative costs between items. And, and also, naturally, these occur as, as constraints often. For example, we might want to, we want, we might want to maximize diversity or coverage, uh, but we have a budget constraint in the form of a kind of cooperative cost. So this kind of now motivates our problem, uh, which we shall actually introduce. So uh, historically, it turns out that this problem has been handled uh, we are uh, difference between submodular function optimization, um, where in some sense we have the cooperative costs and we have the, 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 the function capturing coverage and diversity, and we have this parameter lambda, which kind of, uh, which kind of looks at the, the combination of the two. In some sense, though, this is a very nice model, it turns out that these problems are really hard. And in fact, they're not only NP hard, but they are even NP hard to approximate. So, in, so in, this, in this talk and in this paper, we actually introduce the following formulation, which, which also I would like to point out is, is, is often more natural in some sense. So this formulation basically is, um, is what we call SCSC and SCSK, which is submodular cost, submodular cover, and submodular cost, submodular knapsack. The main idea here is that uh, we minimize a certain submodular function which kind of models cooperation, having a coverage constraint on the other submodular function, or we might want to maximize a submodular function cap uh, capturing coverage or diversity while kind of having a budget constraint on the cooperation. Interestingly, though DS optimization is actually NP hard to approximate, this problem kind of retains approximation guarantees. Uh, I would also like to point out that uh, we, we shall actually assume throughout this talk uh, that uh, the functions f and g are monotone submodular. So our main problems are, uh, our main contributions are, in some sense, we, we, we show how SCSC and SCSK are two formulations, subsume a lot of important and, and commonly occurring optimization problems re related to submodular functions. We provide, um, a kind of unifying algorithmic framework for these problems. We also provide a kind of complete characterization on the hardness of these problems, and, and we shall actually emphasize the scalability and practicality of some of, uh, some of our algorithms. So a motivation uh, and a kind of special case of our formulation is the submodular set cover and the submodular knapsack where we have, where the costs are additive, but we have coverage and diversity as submodular functions. And these occur in a number of applications like sensor placement, data subset selection, document summarization. In each case, we kind of want to find subsets 
which which cover uh, cover information of the entire uh, the entire ground set or the entire set of items, uh, and at the same time we have constraints in the form of uh, in the form of budget constraints, which could be, for example, the number of sentences or the number of sensors. A, a, a second special case of this is uh, where we have cooperative costs as submodular functions, but we have the other function here as an additive function. And again, this also occurs in, in, uh, in a number of applications. For example, where we want, uh, where we want uh, speech corpus subset selection with limited vocabulary. Naturally, we can kind of formulate the problem of uh, choosing, choosing a largest uh, corpus of utterances um, with a budget uh, on the vocabulary as, as an instance of this problem, since, uh, the, since the function capturing, um, capturing vocabulary can be modeled via a bipartite neighborhood function, which is submodular. The general case is, um, is SCSC and SCSK, where we have both the functions F and G as submodular, and, uh, and these also occur in a number of applications, for example, the sensor placement problem, um, but instead of but instead of additive costs, we could have submodular costs, and in some sense, as cooperation, cooperative costs between sensors, which, which actually is, is very natural in many applications. Uh, another application is the same limited vocabulary, speech corpus selection, but instead of, uh, instead of just having, uh, uh, instead of just trying to maximize the number of utterances, we might want to have an acoustically diverse speech corpus. And a third application, which also can be modeled in this way, is a kind of privacy preserving communication application. So um, it turns out that the problems SC and SCSC and SCSK are actually very closely related, and they are related in some sense via these bicriteria approximation factors. So um, bicriteria approximation factors are uh, are actually kind of approximation factors which have been used a lot in the theory community. And essentially, what they mean is that we have a, we have an approximation factor on on um, on the set X here. But at the same time, we, 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 we in some sense relax the constraints a little bit by allowing, to, to, uh, allowing the set to satisfy a kind of relaxed constraint which is given by rho. So here, note that the, the parameter sigma is greater than one and rho is less than one. Similarly, we can, um, we can define a bicriteria approximation factor for, S, for the other problem, SCSK, um, where again we have an approximation guarantee on the set but instead of, instead of having a kind of, uh, instead of satisfying the budget exactly, we kind of relax the budget by this factor sigma. So in some sense, we cheat a little bit here, but, um, but, but often these guarantees have been used a lot in the theory community, and, and in practice, these numbers are really, uh, are not that large even. So our main result, which kind of connects the problems SCSC and SCSK, are that given a particular bicriteria approximation algorithm for one of the problems, we can actually run that algorithm multiple times potentially to get a almost matching uh, bicriteria approximation for the other problem. So essentially what this means is that both these problems are closely related and, uh, and kind of have, all, have matching approximation guarantees and hardness results. So now getting to our algorithmic framework, um, one of a one of a key uh, um, key elements in provide, in the analysis and providing uh, pro providing a results is uh, the notion of a curvature of a submodular function, which kind of captures the 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 distance between the submodular function to a linear function. So it measures how close to linearity is a submodular function. And in some sense. Um, Curvature is one of a fundamental complexity parameters which kind of modulates the hardness of different submodular optimization problems. We shall see even in this case that the curvature provides a very interesting modulation in the hardness. So uh, before, giving the, before providing our, uh, our, our framework of algorithms, we actually kind of look at the hardness and lower bounds and provide a kind of complete characterization of the hardness. So, um, when you have the functions f and g as modular functions, um, we can actually, we have, uh, there are algorithms which achieve fp tas or fully polynomial time approximation scheme kind of guarantees. And, and this, is, this is a standard knapsack problem. When the function f is modular and the function g is submodular, 
This is the submodular set cover and the submodular knapsack problem. And, and again, we have constant factor approximation guarantees, and, and the guarantees in some sense are kind of modulated by the curvature of the submodular function G. When the function F is submodular but the function G is modular, the guarantees are much worse. And the guarantees are kind of square root n in the worst case, but again, the curvature of the submodular function F provides a kind of modulation of the hardness of these. And finally, we have um, the functions F and G being both submodular, and the hardness of this problem is actually the same as the hardness when the function G is modular. So an immediate observation here is that the hardness depends mainly on the curvature of the submodular function F and, and, and kind of very loosely on the curvature of G. So our algorithmic framework is as follows. We repeat the following. Um, we, we, we have an iterative procedure. The main idea is that um, we choose surrogate functions f hat and g hat for the submodular functions f and g. The main intuition is that these surrogate functions would be easier than the original submodular functions. And, and in some sense, we obtain, um, we obtain the optimizers by solving the problems sc, sc, and SK, sc, sk with these surrogate functions instead of the functions f and g. So it's a very simple algorithmic framework. And, uh, and, and, and for this talk, we actually, uh, and in this paper, we actually look at surrogate functions of the form of modular upper bounds and lower bounds of submodular functions and, and approximations of submodular functions. So um, getting to the surrogate functions, we have modular upper bounds, which in some sense are akin to subgradients. Uh, of, of a convex function, and, 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 and in some sense, these are tight modular upper bounds which are induced via orderings of the elements of the ground set. We also have modular upper bounds, and we have two specific modular upper bounds which again are tight, and these are akin to super gradients of a concave function, uh, and, and, and we have two specific instances of modular upper bounds. So in some sense, again, um, we have subgradients. Uh, of a submodular function, and we have super gradients of a submodular function. And the third kind of surrogate function which we, which we, we, we look at are, are approximations, uh, and, and, and we, should, we, actually use, uh, we, we actually use ellipsoidal approximations of submodular functions, which in some sense give tightest approximations, theoretically. So um, we look at now a special case of SCSC and SCSK, which is a submodular set cover and submodular knapsack. It turns out that the classical greedy algorithm, which was actually uh, shown in the 80s for both these problems, can be seen as a special instance of our framework when, um, the, function, when the function G is kind of replaced by its modular lower bound. And in some sense, the approximation guarantees are constant factor. I would like to point out that the, the approximation guarantees for a submodular knapsack is, is, is constant factor directly. Uh, the approximation guarantees for the submodular set cover are actually log factors, but, uh, but, but through our analysis, we can actually show that they have constant factor by criteria approximation guarantees. Now, getting back to our original problem, SCSC and SCSK, we provide very simple iterative, we provide an algorithm which is very simple and, and, and iterative technique. Essentially, we choose a surrogate function as a modular upper bound. And iteratively, we solve the submodular set cover and the submodular knapsack. Our main result here is that we get an approximation guarantee that depends on the dimension of the problem and the curvature. Sorry. I'm going to do 
this connection. Yeah, I think that's fine, that's fine. Right. Our second framework of algorithms are where we use the ellipsoidal approximation. So essentially we use the ellipsoidal approximation as a surrogate function for the, for the submodular function f. And our main result here is that we can we get a guarantee again depending on, on the dimension of the problem and the curvature. And this kind of improves the guarantee from a factor n to a factor square root n. Right, so I would like to point out that this, act, this algorithm actually gets a guarantee which matches the hardness of the problem up to log factors. So, so now finally we would like to look at some applications. Um, we look at the limited vocabulary data subset selection problem. Um, we kind of model the acoustic diversity via submodular functions like the facility location and uh, the saturated coverage function, which kind of are, uh, are naturally coverage functions. And um, we capture the notion of limited vocabulary via a bipartite neighborhood function. So we actually compare our results on the timid speech corpus. Uh, and as a baseline, we just, uh, we just choose random subsets. So, so these are the results where we actually compare the valuations. Our main observations are that, first of all, all, all our algorithms perform much better than just choosing random subsets which means that they seem to work in some sense. And, and secondly, we, we see, and secondly, the most importantly, we see that the iterative and much faster algorithms perform in some sense comparably to the much slower and tight uh, ellipsoidal approximation-based algorithms empirically. So to conclude, uh, we propose some very efficient, scalable, and tight approximation algorithms and kind of a complete characterization of the hardness. Um, in the, what we have in the paper, but not in this talk, is we actually have some extensions to kind of handle multiple constraints and non-monotone submodular functions. And as future work, we are we are really interested and um, we are eager to kind of in, uh, uh, kind of look at our algorithms for a lot of real-world applications. Um, so thank you. I'd like to take some questions.